All right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, closing the digital curation gap as a notion, as an event, as a project. Um, a little bit about the project itself, but also about why we're here, some of my own perspectives on where I think things have been moving and why I think it's very important to be engaged in these sort of activities that are trying to essentially diffuse innovations that are already out there into professional practice in a variety of environments. Uh, so digital curation, we should probably start out with a definition, right, for those who don't use this term all the time. We tend to use this term a lot. Uh, the active management and preservation of digital resources for current and future generations of users. So it's basically taking care of digital stuff, as we talked about um, yesterday in a discussion that I had about this. Um, so it can be inclusive of activities in libraries and archives, in corporate environments, dealing with data sets, all kinds of different things that haven't necessarily had their own label previously, but all engage in these activities related to dealing with long-term care of digital materials. Uh, so a very brief kind of selective uh, history of some of the things that have been going on with digital curation professional um, evolution. Uh, so if you look at the middle of the previous century, um, the organizations, of course, were increasingly relying on collections of computer-dependent data, but there were um, also these various streams of activity related to dealing with digital materials that were fairly independent of each other going on. People working in different environments, some people dealing with the physical media, some people dealing with online environments uh, that basically were kind of all doing their own thing. Right? Then we had, over the later part of the century, uh, certainly into the 80s and 90s, we had two very fundamental things going on from my perspective. We had those with long traditions of preserving physical artifacts, basically cultural institutions, library archives and museums, who of course were now aware that there were digital materials, either born digital materials, things that they were digitized and they had to be responsible for, but also a lot of people who had expertise in dealing with things like large scale system migrations, uh, configuration management, all kinds of things that they had been doing for a long time but weren't necessarily seeing from a preservation perspective, right? That the people who had expertise in, in data centers, people in corporate environments, um, were also starting to recognize that preservation was a very important part of dealing with their data and not just making sure that it was reliably accessible at a given point in time. Uh, if we move into the 90s, we had separate streams of activity that really started coming together quite a bit. This is where there was a lot more discussion of a term like digital preservation as a unifying concept. Um, a lot more awareness, I would say, of our dependency on computer systems, right? The Euro conversion, the uh, Y2K, all these things that got people realizing that there were bits and pieces of code out there, technologies that we really depend upon, and if we don't pay attention to them, we could be in big trouble. Um, and then also some broadening awareness of just digital preservation as an issue in and of itself, right? We had the Scientific American piece that Jeff Rothenberg uh, published back in 95. Um, the task force report um, in 96, also the movie Into the Future, which I highly recommend to anyone who wants to step back into the 90s. Um, it was actually quite inspiring to me as a young grad student trying to figure out what to do with my life, that wow, look at this problem, maybe we could work on this, right? Um, so also there's been this activity uh, around what we tend to call in the US, largely through the influence of the National Science Foundation and activities um, within the NSF of calling it cyber infrastructure, right? Basically supporting the activities that people are engaged in in terms of scholarly communications, dealing with data, uh, by recognizing that this requires some infrastructural investment, right? So for example, NSF creating the Office of Cyber Infrastructure saying, we can't just fund all these individual projects, we actually have to invest in the capacity to make sure that the data will be available over time. Um, in Europe and elsewhere, there tend to be more use of terms like e-science, e-research, but it's still this notion that data-driven activities in science need to get more um, attention. And so you see things like data curation coming up quite a bit in that discussion. And also things like the formation of the Digital Curation Center in the UK, which um, has a fairly broad scope, but has a pretty heavy emphasis on uh, scientific data and data sets. So we've adopted this term digital curation to be inclusive, more inclusive than things like digital preservation, digital archives, whatever term we might pick. Um, more recently, I would say some of the trends that are very important to be thinking about, there's the what I would call the big data obsession, right? Oh, it's such a great phrase. It's everywhere. It's kind of like the cloud, right? Um, and so it, it ends up being something that I think, for better or for worse, a lot of us have to attend to because this is where a lot of energy, resources, attention are going, right? And ultimately, I think people who are information professionals can enter this discussion and say, hey, there's a whole lot that people are talking about. You know, hey, how about selecting some data out of all of this, right? That's been within the purview of information professionals for quite a long time. 
Um, there's a lot of discussion in digital curation, digital library, digital archives, um, events and communities about the need for data management plans, right, that funding agencies are requiring them. Obviously increasing budgetary pressures, which I think is very important to the context of what we're talking about today, because the notion is, you know, we can go read the latest proceedings of some research conference and know some tool that's been developed. That doesn't really help us to figure out how to implement it, to adopt it, to incorporate it into practices in an institution that are increasingly feeling budgetary pressures on, you know, staff, on available time, everything else. Uh, movement toward audit and certification of repositories, so the ISO standard that's recently been issued. So this notion that we've now we've reached enough level of maturity that so there's some institutions that have been dealing with data and digital collections long enough that they can be subject to this kind of oversight and auditing to see whether they're doing a good job of it. Uh, the increasing availability of both commercial and open source tools to perform, um, I guess you can fill in the blank, uh, to form a variety of digital curation activities, right? So all kinds of open source tools out there, a lot of, uh, you know, several different vendors who now basically proclaim that their systems are preservation environments and sell them as such and people buy them and adopt them, right? Which wasn't the case, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and growth of digital curation and development community, right? So, um, for example, the fact that you could go to Code for Lib or something, right? A conference that's, ooh, all the geeky people, right? And have people who basically are librarians or archivists who have developed software to solve the problems that they're confronting, right? I think that that's something that's also been growing pretty, um, you know, in, in exciting directions in the past several years. Uh, so, the gap is what we're really trying to address here, right? There's um, from the perspective of, I would say, Helen and me, the motivation for putting this project together in the first place is that there's a pretty significant gap, arguably a growing gap, between the research frontier, right? You go to a joint conference on digital libraries, you go off to, to IPRES, you go to these different events, and you see various projects that are funded by big grants that people are engaged in, they've got models, they've got resources, they've got tools, but they're not necessarily being picked up and used in institutions that have the variety of constraints that I've just been talking about. Um, there are a lot of these things, applications, models, strategies, standards that are out there. I see a lot of my role as a professional educator to try to make people aware of those bridges that they can build, right? Oh, you want to deal with data that are on physical media? There's this whole discipline of digital forensics that does these things, right? You want to appraise and select materials from the web? There's a whole conference of people who talk about web archiving every single year. Let's try to learn a little bit from them, right? Uh, many institutions are either not aware of these various things that are out there or they're having a lot of difficulty in evaluating and implementing them, right? It's not just the implementing, it's also how do I get started? Where do I look? What kinds of things should I be asking? So the Closing the Digital Curation Gap Project, and we're going to talk a bit later today about some guides that are under development um, as part of this project, um, started back in 2009. It's been extended until just a little bit from now. <laughs> we're almost done. Uh, the partners are Institute for Museum and Library Services, um, uh, by implication, of course, the School of Information and Library Science, who's not listed there, but that's us, right? Uh, just in the UK, so Joint Information Systems Committee and the Digital Curation Center. The goals are to establish and support a network of digital curation professionals, researchers, and educators through a variety of things, meetings, web-based communications, um, and establish a baseline of digital curation practice and knowledge, especially, and this was really a big part of the proposal, is small and medium-sized institutions, which we have determined is essentially everyone but the Library of Congress and the National Archives. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to aim for small and medium. And we actually found in our focus groups that several people who worked for the Library of Congress were convinced that they worked in a small institution and thought that we should classify them as such. Because they were working within a unit in the library that actually was not so big, right? Uh, so today's event is about addressing issues and initiatives that are related to digital curation, capacity building in a variety of ways, right? We've had an event like Curate Gear here not too long ago that was very much all about the tools. Today is much more about the guidance and the initiatives to try to get people started on all of these things. Um, exploring continuing education and development of resources to guide these activities. And the speakers represent, as you'll see if you look through the, you know, the bios in the program, represent a variety of projects and initiatives that are aiming to basically close this gap. Um, and I should say that a number of people who are here today also are advising the CDCG project and we're going to be meeting tomorrow as a project to um, sort of wrap up and set directions for future activities. So that is what I have.